Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fourth day of Campus Party Europe. Uh, we have a very interesting program lined up today. Um, we'll be starting talking about um, a very, very powerful computer used to do one of the fastest and most efficient computations to better understand the Milky Way. And our speaker, Professor Simon Portugies Zwart, uh, started in astronomy. He's always been fascinated uh, by astronomy, but also when he was young, he already was programming on his Commodore 64, making computations that are so heavy, he would blow it up, and then his parents would have to replace it. Uh, and from there, uh, one day his professor, a professor from Utrecht, gave him a call. He said, I have a very nice PhD for you, and it's a very complex uh, problem. And I haven't found anybody who could solve it, but I believe you can. And that's where he went into computational astrophysics. And from there, he did a postdoctoral research, not only in Japan, but MIT, uh, to further learn on the subject. And what's interesting to know, uh, the government has awarded him a grant to work on a supercomputer you can build using parts you can find from the shop. And at 1% efficiency, our previous speaker yesterday was mentioning that a supercomputer can take up, running it all year, cost millions of euros in power. So this presentation is about using one of the most powerful supercomputers in an efficient way to run a simulation with less energy with the same results. So please give a very warm welcome to Professor Simon Portugies Zwart. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid that my parents didn't buy this new Commodore 64 computers, but I had to make, you know, go buy the, 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 the people to put in newspapers in their pigeonholes in order to buy it myself. But uh, apart from that, it's, uh, it's a nice story. So I was asked to uh, tell you something about what, uh, what we do on supercomputing and astronomy. And I'm not sure what sort of your astronomy or computing background is. Your computing background, I presume, is pretty reasonable, but your astronomy background may not be up to sort of uh, understanding the Milky Way. Well, I don't understand the Milky Way either, but that's all what we're going to talk about. Well, this is a rendition of one of these simulations, and here you sort of see the structure of the Milky Way on one side, that's here. Okay, see this is all, this pointer? And you see sort of how it looks like in the computer on the other side. And I will tell you a little bit how we got there, and how you can do this. And uh, let me start at, uh, at the planet where we live on, where we're sitting now. And the planet has a size of about 13,000 kilometers, right, in diameter. And if you go to the moon, that's about 360,000 kilometers away. And in between Earth and moon, there is basically nothing. There is complete empty space. So you can wonder, if you have empty space, it's very easy to compute what's happening there. So what do you want to compute? Is what is the forces, what is the gravity, what keeps the moon bound to the Earth? Or what keeps the, mo the, mo the Earth bound to the moon? which is pure gravity. And of course, as you know, it's tidal effects. If you go to the, sh the, sh the shore, you'll see the tides. You can build a sandcastle, and you see that how the moon affects the destruction of your sandcastle by pulling, out, pulling at the water, and then the water goes up, and then you have the tides. Now, the sun and the earth and the moon are part of what we call the Milky Way. And this is not our Milky Way, of course, because we're sitting in the middle, so we can't look inside the Milky Way. We can only look outside it and you can't look very well through it, but this is a nearby Milky Way galaxy. And as you see, the size of the object is 10 to the 19 kilometers. So it's a one with 19 zeros, and that's the size of the whole Milky Way. It contains about 100 billion stars, and 100 billion is really, is really quite a lot, I can tell you, right? 100 billion, if you have 100 billion euros, well, you know, dream on, right? I mean, uh, if you have 100 billion stars, you can also dream on, you could say. Well, if, but we don't know, if each of these stars has, say, 10 planets, like, you know, the sun on which we orbit has about 10 planets, we would have a trillion planets. Well, imagine a trillion planets. I mean, who knows there is life on one of these planets? Well, there's the life on one of these planets. It may not be very intelligent, but it is their life. And there are a quadrillion, at least, planetesimals, so small bodies around. So you see the stars, but all the other stuff you don't see. So how can you infer where all the other stuff is? Well, not by looking at it, because you can't see it. So the only way to infer where all these planets is, is by simulation. But to simulate a whole galaxy with 100 billion stars, 
on my little laptop, it's completely impossible. If you think about a trillion planets, well, that's the impossible to sort of a high power, right? So that's completely impossible to think about even how to do it. So you have to go over a very big computer, and you have to write a very efficient code to do it. And that's exactly what we try doing. And, you know, in part what we did. So we did the, the stars, not yet the planets. The planets is sort of the next challenge to do. So how can we simulate that? How did we do it? Now, first of all, you have to imagine that science is built on pillars. And the pillars are sometimes as old as this one. Is Now, can you name the pillars? Let's, for example, observation and lab experiments are two pillars of science. All the science we know are based on lab experiments. And astronomers can't do lab experiments very well. I mean, have you ever taken a black hole in your laboratory? Well, I can recommend don't do it, right? <laughs> it will cost you a new laboratory and maybe more. So uh, observations and experiments. And then another thing is theorizing. Can you mesmerize about the universe? Of course you can, but then you have to test it with the observations or with the, simula or, or with the uh, ex lab experiments. And the third pillar or fourth pillar of science which recently sort of has been recognized as being an important way of doing science, is by simulation, by mimicking the universe, by putting the laws of physics in your little computer or in your big computer, and then simulate how the universe would look like. And then you can put a black hole in your computer or in your lab. You can put the entire galaxy in your laboratory. So it's a very powerful way to study the universe. The problem, of course, always is, is it correct? Is your understanding of the physics you put in the computer correct? Or do you put in the wrong physics? If you put in the wrong physics, well, you get the wrong answers, right? And you're not understanding anything of the universe, but you're understanding something else, namely the errors you make, for example. And there are many people studying the errors they make in their computers, which you don't want to do, right? You all have made bugs, I'm sure. If you, if you program, you make bugs. I make bugs too, right? I may even make more bugs than you do. But you have to be very careful that they're all removed before you do something, well, let's say, scientific with it. And then still there may be bugs around. Now, you all know Moore's law, and you all know how the computers have been sort of growing in speed, right? Every two years, the total number of computer cycles we have available sort of doubles, roughly speaking. Sort of the popular way of presenting Moore's law. Well, telescope has done exactly the same thing. Telescope double in size every 80 years. Now, here you see an example of such telescope. This is the large telescope, the VLT, which is on the mountaintop in Chile. And it's partly a Dutch telescope, but it is way bigger than we could build. So it, it's way more expensive. So we built it with the entire European community. And this is on top of a mountain. And this object, this instrument, is so big that from the first telescope in, uh, in 1608, it has been growing with a doubling time in collecting area, collecting light area, every 80 years. So every four or five generations of astronomers have been enjoying a bigger instrument. Well, computers have also a very long history in growing in size. And we sort of forget that, but the first computers were really the abaci, right? The little abacus, which you can program. You cannot really program it, but you can do relatively complex calculations on it if you're sufficiently handy with your fingers. And certainly, you need ten fingers in order to operate the machine. The first really digital computers, for example, this von Neumann machine, and they still have a replica of that in the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, so you can look at it built of wood, you know, with lamps and things like that. You, know, you can really touch the thing. You can really imagine that a bug somewhere is sitting in between the relays. That is 30 million times faster than the abacus, than we can calculate on a sort of machine we can help. Then a few years later, Jun Makino, with whom I did my postdoctoral research in Japan, built the first teraflop computer, the first computer that breaks the teraflop barrier. <coughs> it's like building a space rocket in, an, in, a, in a place where only people ride bicycles, right? That is building the great machine. It's like a GPU. Now you have this machine in your GPU in your PC, basically, right? Imagine, so my PC is as quick as that machine over there. And it was built originally from sort of off-the-shelf material, which you can buy in Akihabara, which is sort of an electronic town in Tokyo. And now these days we do our calculation on these lower machines, this one, for example. The big supercomputers, we take holes like this, and they're basic huge air conditioning machines because the computer produces a lot of heat and the lead has been sucked away by, by air conditioning and all the electricity go in the air conditioning of the environment. So if you go on one side of the room and you're just wet from bicycling and you go on the one side of the room, it's blazingly hot and you dry up very quickly. And you go to the other side, you're basically freezing. 
So it's a very interesting experience to walk from one side to the other side. Now the problem with computers a little bit, and the problem with computer scientists, who of you is a computer scientist here? Are the compu are they, are they, am I going to embarrass anybody? No? Good. So the, the problem with computer scientists is that the doubling in computer speeds every two years means that computer scientists have difficulty sort of keeping track of the speed increase of computers. Imagine that somebody, a professor in computer science now, never had a lecture course on computer science. Right? Have you ever realized that? So a student in computer science is trained by professors who had no computers by the moment they did their PhD, simply because they weren't around. Astronomers, it's a completely different story. You know, the telescope has been growing so slowly in size that it's incomparable. So the problem with computer science a little bit is that we are sort of stuck in the regime that the computers get faster and faster and faster, quicker than we can think. And we can not think fast enough to think about improving our algorithms because we are, we are, you know, the computer gets faster anyway. Why should I improve my algorithms? Why should I make my algorithms quicker if the computer gets faster anyway? I can just be lazy and, you know, lay back and wait and uh, buy a bigger computer, right? <laughs> so it's a very convenient way in doing your science. So the consequence is that researchers in computer science very often are limited by trying to make things faster and faster rather than trying to do the bigger things, trying to see what we can really do with computers. Think out of the box. So there is a fantastic opportunity for young researchers in computer science to go into that field because it's going to be a tremendous revolution. I mean, it has been a revolution already, but it's only getting better. This is only getting better. So go in computer science. So the consequence is that you start wondering who is really doing the science? Who is really the person thinking? Is it, are we apes just typing in our numbers in the computer? Or are we really using in our intellectual capacity to do more with the computer than, than we could do before? <coughs> if you look at the algorithms we use, they're basically the same as they were 30 years ago. And is that mean, does it mean that the algorithms cannot be improved? Or does it mean that we're sort of stuck with the algorithms and we just do the same thing over and over again? I don't know, right? I don't know the answer to these questions. I just put it into you and hope that you do something with it. So become a brilliant computer scientist and show us how you can be more original with computers than we are today. Now, if you want to simulate the Milky Way galaxy, you have to be a little bit original because you basically can't. You cannot simulate the galaxy. It's too big. So the only way to simulate the galaxy is basically by ignoring everything. The more you ignore and you only leave the fundamental physics behind. So the only thing you leave behind is gravity. Gravity is a very important ingredient which determines the structure and the evolution of the Milky Way galaxy. So you ignore the gas dynamics. You ignore the stars. Stars are just particles, you know. They, they may have no size. They cannot collide. You just want, you're just interested in the gravitational evolution of the entire big galaxy with its 100 billion stars. And you ignore the human population and everything else. You ignore yourself, basically. So the only thing you solve is this very simple equation you had at high school. You had this at high school, right? Well, my daughter is not here anymore. She was here a minute ago, but, but she has this not yet at high school. But you should have had. So this equation is thought of by this guy, and you know who that is, right? Who is this guy? Newton, yeah, thank you. Newton. And Newton wrote a book, and we have a copy of the book in the Haarlem's Museum, in the Taylor's Museum in Haarlem, which is uh, in the library there. You can go there and you can look in the book. It's very nice, a nice book. It's a bit old, but still good. So Newton's equation of motion is this thing. So what you do is you calculate a force. And the force is the same thing. Well, it's another thing than in Star Trek or Star Wars. But the force is the thing that keeps the moon and the Earth together, that keeps Earth and moon together with the sun. The force is the thing that keeps the whole galaxy together. That sounds a bit like Star, Tra Star Wars. So the force you can calculate by doing a summation. And a summation means that you have to collect all the forces from all the stars in the galaxy to you. So if we calculate the force from the entire Milky Way on us, we have to calculate 100 billion forces, 100 billion distances to other stars, and multiply them and divide them in this way. So you have the mass of the other star divided by the distance to the other star. And of course, you need the direction. And that is what this E is stating here, right? So the distance, the, the mass divided by the distance squared, and that's for all the stars. And that you have to do for all these stars. So all the stars attract each other. And that is what you call an n-squared complexity. If you have n stars, 
If you have 100 billion stars, you have to do 100 billion times 100 billion calculation. And that is only for one time step, one step in time. So maybe you have to do 100 billion of those time steps. So then you have 100 billion to the third power of operations to do. Now this computer can do 10 to the 12 operations. Come on, this is it's a laughable machine, sorry. It's a laughable machine, right? So you have to go to a real big machine in order to do that, where you can really do all those operations. And still you have to be smart in order to do it. Because gravity is not so very simple. Gravity has a negative heat capacity. And you think, well, negative heat capacity, that sounds like you have to go to university to understand what the negative heat capacity is. Well, maybe you have to. A negative heat capacity is basically the same thing. I'm driving on the highway, and I see a big truck in front of me which is standing still. And how can I get away from that truck? I slam the brakes. Well, wrong thinking in a negative heat capacity universe. Because if you slam the brakes, you speed up. So if you dissipate energy, you're using that dissipated energy to, to speed up again. So it's a very bad thing to be in a negative heat capacity universe. It's against our intuition. And gravity has a negative heat capacity. The other thing is the o force is an n squared operation, as I already said. 100 billion stars times 100 billion stars affect each other, which is very complex. There is no shielding for gravity, like in molecular dynamics, in electricity and in magnetic fields. I don't feel the gravity, or the, uh, I feel, uh, in principle, I feel the gravity of my laptop, but I don't feel the magnetic fields of my laptop. And that's because of the shielding effect of the electric magnetic radiation. The other thing is, gravity is globally aware. Everything connects with everything. Small distances drive into a discrepancy. If distances get very small, the force goes to infinity, which is not good for your computer. And if the distances are very large, the force goes to zero, which is a good thing. But it has to go to infinity first, which is not get very good for your computer either. And uh, the other thing, which is very interesting, is the equation of motion are intrinsically chaotic. Well, then you start thinking chaotic. What does it mean if something is chaotic? It basically means that the end product is very sensitive to your initial conditions. If you make a very small change, you may end up somewhere completely different. It's like the NS, right? If you step in the wrong train, you know, a small difference, platform A or platform B, you may end up in Groningen instead of in Utrecht, right? So it's not good. Chaoticity is a very complicated thing to deal with. Now, we're not the first ones to do these calculations. The first people who do calculations of the Milky Way was exactly from Holmer, Holmberg. So Holmberg had a whole army of students, and he had light bulbs, and he realized that the light falls off with the same law as with gravity. So what he did, very smartly, is saying, hey, I have a lot of lamps, and the lamps represent sort of the gravity sources. And now I can sort of calculate how gravity operates. And that he did. And we tried reproducing his calculations, not with lamps, within a computer. And this is sort of how it looks like. So you have two galaxies. One is uh, circles, and the other is uh, bullets. And then this is basically trying to reproduce these lamps. But I didn't have this army of students. I had to do it on a computer. But yeah, I didn't need three weeks to do it. I can do it in a few seconds, right? Now, the real challenge is to simulate this thing, the galaxy. Now, why would you like to do that? Now, one reason is that there is this satellite over here, which is called Gaia. And Gaia is launched two years ago in December. And this summer, Gaia will come up with the positions and velocities of 100 billion stars. Sorry, 1 billion stars. One million stars. It will give the positions and velocities of one billion stars. This summer. So all astronomers are going apeshit about this. They think, oh my god, what do I do with all these data, right? How can I make sense of this data? They don't know what to do with it. And the, public, the data is public. You can also do this research, right? And you can do it too. If you load the data, in July the data will be released. You go to the website, you download this one billion stars, positions and velocities. And you can become world famous by doing all the research you can do with this. So one reason we did this calculation is to sort of be ahead of you, so you can scoop us, right? That's the reason why we do this. Now, this is a nice picture of the Milky Way, but this is not how we think it looks like. This is an artist's rendition. This is complete fake. The way the Milky Way looks like is this. This is how we know the Milky Way looks like. All the details are completely lost to us. We don't know it. But Gaia will change that. So this satellite will make a change to this. Now, in order to prepare for this sort of tsunami of data, we built a code to run simulation of the Milky Way, which we can compare with the Gaia data. 
And the code you call bonsai because it's small and it's a very detailed, very good code to do it. The galaxy in that code looks like a green mess and that is because we use GPUs to do the calculations. And we use graphics cards basically. And we were the first to do astronomical calculations on graphics cards 10 years ago. Nobody did it. And we thought, oh, let's do it, you know, that sounds like fun to take graphics cards to do our astronomy calculations. And instead of calculating all the forces between all the stars, we thought, let's be smart. If I have to calculate the force from Andromeda galaxy to me, that's 100 billion stars, I don't have to take each of these stars into account. Why don't I say I have an Andromeda left and I have an Andromeda right? And I reduce my force calculation from 10 to the, uh, fr from 100 billion to only two calculations. So I make my calculations cheaper by sort of blocking up space in pieces and say this piece has 100,000 stars and this piece has a million stars. And I save orders of magnitude in computing. So that's what we did and we poured it to the GPU, to the graphics card. So all the calculations are done on the graphics card. And the advantage of that is that you don't have any communication anymore. No communication between the host PC and the graphics card, which is sort of expensive because the graphics card is connected to the PCI bus, right? And the PCI bus is slow. So you don't want communication. You want to do the calculation on the graphics card and your chip, your, 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 your Intel chip or whatever you have, has to do something else. And if you have done that, and you can do it on one graphics card, you can parallelize it. And you can say, instead of one graphics card, I may have two graphics cards. Now, every time you do that, you have to do that in a cascade of computers. So first you experiment, you build your own computer in your lab, you're putting in a graphics card, write your code, and say, hey, this goes well, you know. Now we are ready to go to two graphics cards. So you go to two graphics cards, a bigger computer, you build a bigger computer, and everything breaks. And the reason is that running two computers at the same time is completely different than running one computer. So we had to redesign the code, rebuild it completely, and then we say, hey, now we are ready to go to 10 computers in one go. So you port your computer to 10 computers, you have to talk to a friend and say, can I use your computer? And he says, yeah, sure. What are you going to do with it? Well, we're going to run a galaxy. Ah, yeah, okay, good. Uh, go ahead. So you run to the 10 computers and your code breaks and all the assumptions you have been making before on your one computer or your two computers break down. So you have to redesign the code, you have to rewrite everything, and then you go from 10 GPUs, you go to 100 GPUs, and the whole story starts over again. And from 100 GPUs, you go to 1,000 GPUs, and in the end, you end up with Titan. That's the bottom machine here. And Titan is a 20 teraflop, com a 20 petaflop computer. It was at that time the biggest computer on the planet, and it has 20,000 GPUs. Well, 20,000 GPUs, that means you have to parallelize your code over 20,000 GPUs. You have to compare programming a computer like that, like, you know, you have to learn how to ride a tricycle, and somebody, somebody gives you a Ferrari racing car, and he says, you know, you can ride a tricycle, of course you can ride this Ferrari, right? Well, and with the Ferrari, you're about here, right? So this is more like Starship Enterprise compared to your tricycle. It is really a different game. It took us seven years to learn how to program this machine. Now, the way they do it is very technical, so I'm not going to bore you with all the technicalities. But in principle, we do it with something that is called piano Hilbert curves. So basically, we let the computer data make a, a, a move through the computer. So the whole data is sort of streaming through the supercomputer and then doing all the calculations at the same time. And the advantage is you can do the calculations and you can do the simulations all at the same time. And the communication you hide basically in all the uh, calculations you do. So it's very nice. It's a very nice algorithm. I can recommend you to look in the code. It's public. So now you can do your own computer if you have time on Titan. You say, hey, I want to run bonsai on your supercomputer, Mr. Titan. And you know what Titan then says? Yeah, they say, this was fun the last time you did it, right? So how do you get time on such a supercomputer? Do you know? You can get time on the supercomputer. You know that? So how do this? You write a proposal. You say, I want to have time on your big machine. And I want to do this calculation. And I'm from the Netherlands. You know, we, we know how to do this. And you know, in America, they say, Netherlands? Well, the Netherlands doesn't strike me as a supercomputer nation. Do you really know how to program a computer at all? So our proposal was rejected. But the director of Titan, he saw the proposal and he saw, hey, do you know, you never know. Maybe these guys are not as crazy as they look. Maybe they can do it because it sounds very interesting. So he phones me and he says, can you do it? I said, well, yes, I think we can do it. Okay, he says, you get one day on the computer. 
Now imagine one day on a computer. This is a hundred million euro machine. One day on a computer costs basically a million euros. So you get one day for free, right? Let's say if I give you a million euros, what are you going to do with it, right? Buy a sailing boat, buy a house, or run a supercomputer. Well, we got the supercomputer. So you get a, you get a million euros, basically. And in one day, and he monitors what you're doing. So at the end of the day, we were tired. Everything failed. Really, it was a complete disaster. We could hardly use a quarter of the machine. So this guy phones me again. He says, it's you know, how's it going? I said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, you know, you give me all the time, but we couldn't do anything with it. He says, well, I think it goes pretty good. He says, you're serious? Yeah, yeah, you want another day? I said, yes, yes, of course, I want another day. So we go another day, and we work 24 hours a day and 24 hours a night, if that was possible. So after the second day, we had really good results. So this guy co phoned me again. He says, oh, you know, it goes really well. It goes really well. You get another day. You know, this is my follow off You get another day. I said, no, we can't accept it. Because if you want to kill us, fine, you know. But after two days of, you know, 24 hours a day working, give us an another 24 hours, let's say, in three months. And he did. And then we programmed the computer in such a way that we got full performance at 85% efficiency on the entire machine. It has never been shown before. And we were nominated for the Gordon Bell Prize. You know the Gordon Bell Prize? It's like the Nobel Prize for computer scientists, but nobody knows about it because, you know, it's only for computer scientists. <laughs> so I go to my director at the State of Achter, said, we were nominated for the Gordon Bell Prize. The first European team getting a nomination for the Gordon Bell Prize. And my director says, what is this, is, it, is this an important prize? Come on. So if I give this talk at a computer science audience and I show this curve, and you may think, what the hell is this curve, right? I mean, I get a, I get a standing ovation, right? Because this is the number of, of computers, cores, and this is the efficiency in the flop rate. How many flops are you producing? Now, your PC at home is about here, right? Your GPU is about here, if you have a top-of-the-line GPU. And this is 10,000 times the speed of a single GPU. Well, it's actually 20,000 times the speed of a single, single GPU. We use 20,000 GPUs at full efficiency. Now, of course, you want to know how does the result look. So we were phoned by NVIDIA, that's one of the sellers of GPUs, and they say, can we use your simulations to, uh, to, to sell our new hardware at a big conference? And we said, yeah, sure, you know. But, you know, the boss of NVIDIA says, well, actually, but it's a bit boring, you know, single galaxy. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't do much. Can you put in a second galaxy? Okay. So we put in a second galaxy, and this is the movie. So this is the Milky Way, and the other galaxy is coming in, and they collide together, basically. So they hit each other, and they get a curve. So it's coming from the right, I think. Ah, there it is, from the right. So it's the other galaxy, and they smash into each other. So we now calculate how the collision between our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy happens. So our galaxy, well, it's not our galaxy, right? The Milky Way galaxy will collide with the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest, next nearest galaxy. And when the two galaxies collide, now we know what happens. This will happen, because this is purely gravitational interaction. And then there is this CEO of NVIDIA saying, these astrological calculations. So I found the guy, said, this is not astrology, no. This is astronomy. Now, in the end, what you want to know is, for example, understand this object. This is a galaxy. Nobody understands how this formed. We really have no clue at all. There is sort of a galaxy in the middle, and there is sort of a, a galaxy in a ring around it. You know, come on. This is like smoke rings or something. So we did a simulation of this galaxy, and it turns out you can make it. But you have to be extremely patient. So this simulation will go on and go on and go on. And after a very long time, it will eventually turn into something that looks like this, what they call hoax object. So you sort of see it happening already. You get a bar, but this is the, the rotating thing we call a bar. And then you get a sort of an empty cavity in between it. This movie takes a while, so I will, uh, I will go to the next one. If, you, if you're interested in this movie, you can find it somewhere on YouTube, I think. Now, there is one caveat. You can do large calculations. You can say, I'll put in Newton's equation of motion, and it's all correct. We do it right, because we don't make any bugs, or the bugs we make are not important, or, you know, we have tested the code so thoroughly that we know that the bugs don't have a big influence. But there is another thing, and that is chaos. As I said, if you take the wrong train, 
you may end up in a different country, right? Or a different part of the country. Oh, okay, Maastricht may be a different country, but a different part of the country. So how do you deal with chaos? Now, chaos originates in little, very small things in your calculation. You have the 100 billion stars, and if three stars are doing something funny, that may affect the entire galaxy. That sounds a bit strange, right? And this is if two people at the backstage over there are kissing, and somebody there divorces because of that kissing, right? So in human, it can also happen, as long as there is communication between the sort of chaotic environments. Now, chaos, of course, is well known in the arts. This is a picture from Pollock, you know, Jack the Dripper. And Jack the Dripper was very good in making chaos. If you study this painting, it has a fractal dimension, which means it has a measure of chaos. And the fractal dimension of this painting is 1.6. In his early days, he made paintings which have a fractal dimension of 1.2. These paintings are not very expensive. They only cost like uh, 3 or 4 million euros or so. But this painting goes for a massively 20 million euros and has a fractal dimension of 1.6. So what is special about the fractal dimension of 1.6? We like it. The trees have a fractal dimension of 1.6. The people here in the room have a fractal dimension of 1.6, the way they are distributed. So we like it in some reason. And why? I don't know. So if you go back to the three-body problem, if you have two bodies and you have a third body perturbing the three bodies, all kinds of things will happen. The initial conditions are important, so how do you start? And the integration is important. Now, two years ago, I was in Tokyo and I was at the sumo bout. You know sumo? There's these big fat guys and they smash into each other and there's a little arbiter who runs around it. He's like the third body. And um, if you go to Tokyo ever, you know, go to Sumo. It's, it's a lot of fun. So we make a recording of this, and this is Asesorio against Burrito. And here you see them, and the initial condition, generating initial conditions takes about seven minutes. And this is only the last minute of the bout. This is Asesorio, and he's a champion. He's very strong, and he has the tendency to lift up his components and throw them out of the ring. And the other one is Burrito. And there they go. And it's a very small non-linear reaction. There we go. He lifts up his opponent. There's the third body, influencing it. And then there is a bug. So he made a mistake. There was a mistake somewhere in the algorithm. And, uh, and that's causing this uh, sort of non-linear reaction. So an, an error or a mistake in your computer can, make, can respond into a non-linear reaction which progresses further. So how do you deal with that? Now, the only way to deal with that is write a new code. Not a code to do 100 billion particles, but a code to integrate three particles. And so we wrote Brutus, because he's fat too. And it's based on a sort of lot of technical details. But the trick is that with uh, Brutus, you can do an extremely precise calculation on your computer. So the problem is this computer has 16 decimal places to play with. Now, I can't do calculations in 16 decimal places, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not fast enough, but the computer can do that. But 16 decimal places is not good enough. And I'll show you why. So if you do a calculation in six decimal places, which is reasonable, this is sort of the result of a 16-body integration. So this is sort of the movie of how those 16 bodies interact. And then you go to 10 decimal places. So in 10 decimal places, you will see that the whole picture is different. It changes. Not because the physics changes, the physics is exactly the same, but it is just because the way you solve it in the computer changes. Because I round off my last decimal place, and the rounding off affects the result in my calculation. What I did wrong in six decimal places, I do right in ten decimal places. But if I do right in ten decimal places, I also do things wrong. So you have to go to 18 decimal places, or to uh, 22 decimal places or to 50 decimal places, or maybe to 100,000 decimal places. So you get a very long, very slow calculations. And believe me, your computer doesn't get faster due to this. It gets very, very slow. So there is no way, no way at all, that we can do the galaxy with this, such a simulation. The only thing that we can do is study three-body interactions and understand those, and then what we learn from three-body interactions, three stars interacting, to the whole galaxy, where you have 100 billion bodies. Now this will go on, so we, uh, this we, we calculated this until we have like 20,000 decimal places, so the movie is sort of longy. So I will not left you to the very long movie, but I will just conclude in saying that, you know, you can use the largest computer on the planet, you have to invest a lot of effort in it, 
you can all get access to these computers if you ask and if you can demonstrate that you can do it and you can have a lot of fun with it. But be careful. Anything you calculate is probably wrong until proven otherwise. And that's all. Thank you. Let's take some questions from the audience. Hi, uh, you're talking about uh, using GPUs to create a farm uh, of computation, okay? Have you ever heard of uh, quantum computing? Sure. You could, I'm uh, surprised there is not one here. You could, uh, you could achieve uh, that potential uh, calculation uh, with just one computer and better results for your investigation, I think. No way. No? No. Why? So, so the way so a quantum computer works completely differently than sort of the conventional computers I use. So a quantum computer is like a Monte Carlo machine. It's a machine that's very good in making random numbers. And it's very good in, in trying solutions and then throwing them away, and then trying new solutions and throwing them away, and trying and trying and trying until it has the right solution. So a quantum computer is extremely suitable for, for example, cracking codes. Why do you think our government is interested in quantum computers? Not to do embodied simulations but to sort of read Putin's email. So quantum computers are very good at that, but quantum computers are not very good in deterministic calculations. I know the physics behind this. I just don't know the collective effect of the physics. And that's what I'm studying here. And quantum computers cannot do it. At least not this generation of quantum computers and not this way of programming. So the other problem with quantum computers is, first of all, they don't work, right? At least not demonstratively. And the other thing, nobody knows how to program them. So there, there are two sort of problems in quantum computers. But if they work, they work in a stochastic way and not in a deterministic way. So they're not suitable for this sort of problem. So you could make them, you could, so let me, let me give you, you, you're not completely satisfied. So you could make maybe your algorithm into suitable for a quantum computer in saying the galaxy is sort of, there are so many stars, it's like a gas. And I don't care where each individual star is anymore, but I treat it as sort of a random, uh, uh, optimization of the Hamiltonian, right? And that you could put into a sort of quantum computing algorithm. But I'm not sure that you really benefit then from the speed. Well, we have to see. I have one question. Is, uh, what is your baseline or what is your control to know when you've reached the, the right amount of decimal points? Yeah, that's a good question. Your question was good too, or, but it <laughs> I'm not uh, the quantum computer guy. Um, <coughs> it's very difficult, but, it, but the, the way you do it, you have two control parameters, basically. One is the number of mantissa, and the other is the time stepping, the error in your energy. Um, if you do two calculations with subsequent accuracy, and you convert your solution to a certain number of decimal places, which you determine beforehand, then you can say, I'm satisfied. And then you can do a second test, and gravity has a very nice quality you may not be aware of, but Gravity is time reversal, right? Many things in nature are not time reversal. Like human relations are not time reversal, right? And my whole life is not time reversal, regretfully. I mean, in, 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 in uh, 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 California, they are always, they would love time reversal to be possible for human people, right? But that's not. But in gravity, there is time reversibility. And that means if I turn the time around in this calculation, I get my initial conditions back, so I can check it. Wouldn't that apply to eight decimal points or because of the error it wouldn't go back to the same position? It would go back to exactly the same position. But also with eight decimal points. No, no, yeah, but eight, not with eight. No, with the no, right. No, 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 no. Okay. With, with 54 here it did. Okay. Other questions? One there and one here. Um, could you convert your numbers uh, to decimals most of the time in order to avoid the uh, long uh, decimal problem? Uh, like fractions and s store those fractions and uh, use them all the way through the calculation and then at the end turn it into a decimal. Let me, let me, s let me see if I understand your question. You say, can you prevent doing the round off? to a later moment. Y yes, yes. Yeah? We have thought about it, but we haven't come up with a solution. So I don't know. Um, if you have enough, enough memory, 
you may be able to rememorize all sort of the operations you have been doing and just doing them at the last moments. But it's, it's a large number of operations. So I, I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting field of research to study this more. Okay, so you said that you're using purely gravitational pull for the simulations. And you have the N star object. But what about dark matter? You know, you don't have a star and it also has gravitational effects. Is it something you just uh, ignore or, you know, do you compensate for the effects? Well, let me show you that we don't ignore it. You, c you basically can see that we don't ignore our dark matter. Because if dark matter would not be in our simulation, the galaxy would fly apart. That's how dark matter was discovered in the first place. All right? The galaxy is bound. Do you know what dark matter is? Yeah? It, well, no, I don't I know. Think, right. I think it's good to explain. So dark matter is stuff that binds the universe together. And we can't see it, but it keeps, y you can see the effects. So the galaxy rotates like this thing, but there are not enough stars to keep everything bound. So you need something else to keep everything bound. And that stuff you cannot see, so we call it dark matter. Because the background is dark too, right? That's, that's how simple astronomy is, really. So these calculations do include dark matter. And it's interesting that you say so. So the way we do dark matter is by putting in particles we, we don't present on the screen, basically. So it's a very dirty trick. But maybe it's not a dirty trick, because last week there was a paper published that with a new solution for dark matter, that maybe dark matter are black holes between 10 and 100 solar masses. And that is exactly what we put in here in this calculation. So maybe we're, we're just by accident sort of right. Other questions? OK, we have three here. Uh, have you ever compared with uh, some other uh, communities, such as uh, Hadoop, uh, Spark? Have you ever compared the solutions with them? Uh, well, what you name Hadoop, for example, is, is for data streaming. It's not for doing calculations. But if you say, do we compare our result with the results of other people? Yes, of course, we do. But because we can so efficiently program the computer that they do, can do 1,000 times bigger simulation than anybody has ever done before. So I think people maybe they should, we, we do compare, but then we have to trim down the resolution to their pathetic resolution, so to say. And we do that, of course, right? But uh, there, let, me, let me also, I mean, that uh, sounds very nice, right? But it's also another thing. When we, when we propose to do this, people will say, you know, why should you do it? Because we understand how this works. Because there is no point in going to a higher resolution. Because nothing will change. So we get also criticism from the community in doing this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a smart question, but do you, really, do you need Titan to make a good simulation of the, the galaxy if you get the data from Gaia in the, in the summer? So from the 100 billion stars, do you then need the, the supercomputer Titan to make a good uh, simulation of it? It's a very difficult question. So th let, me, let me say something about good questions and bad questions first. So good questions are questions you have. Bad questions are questions you don't have, right? If you, have a, if you don't have a question but you want to say something, that's a bad question. If you, have, you, you want to say that, you're, you, that you, you want to tell me how something works, that's not a good question. That's not a question at all, probably. So your question is honest, and therefore it's a good question. And the, question, the answer is, again, is I don't know. So when we, I don't know what the Gaia data will be. So what I want to do, so the Gaia data is composed of one billion stars. What I would like to do is see where are the other nine, nine, 99 billion stars. Can I infer the positions and velocities, the whereabouts of other, all the other 99 billion stars from this one billion star Gaia will deliver? And can we use that to understand more of the galaxy and then do predictions and go to the observers and say to my observer friends, you should look in that direction because I think there is something funny there. You need a microphone. But they have an advantage, so I understand. The Titan. Gaia people. Yeah, the, the Titan people. Yeah, if you can use Titan for this. Yeah, oh, absolutely, of absolutely. Oh, yeah, we definitely have an advantage. But we made the code public, so now everybody can, can download. You can download it and run it on your laptop. Or on Titan. Oh. <laughs> um, you've been like talking about, uh, to do the calculation, either improving the algorithms or improving the hardware. So you go in actually doing calculations on GPUs. Are there any other 
you know, parts that we didn't uh, explore yet, actually, to improve, you know, the results we had. So you have algorithm, you have hardware. What else can we think so about? So there are, there are several ingredients in such a code and in coding as in general. And of course, the hardware is one of them. The mathematics of how we, how you solve your, these are differential equations. So how do you solve your differential equations is a mathematical problem. How you discretize them, because the computer is a discrete machine. It means that you do have to deal with the decimal places. You do have to deal with clock cycles. You do have to deal with, you know, discrete time stepping. Um, so that is another source of error. And there's another thing which is very important, in particular for mathematics to understand better. So that's the, the algorithm, but that's also the fundamental, how do you solve a differential equation on a discrete machine? How do you write your algorithms? And then, in the end, how do you write it up? How do you put it in your computer? What language do you use? Uh, do you use classes or do you, you would, no, how, how smart are you? How complex do you make it? That's, that's all important. But the most important is, can you ask the right question? Oh, that's a lot of pressure now. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> no. no, no, not you for you. Oh, it's okay. That's the general for me. Okay. Sorry, that's the general. That's the general question for the scientist. Can the scientist ask the right question? Yeah, but do you have like teams working on every part in, in, in each of these parts actually to improve? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In Leiden, we work on every part of of the whole stream, from the mathematics and the hardware building until the astrophysics, and ask ourselves the wrong questions. So we ask ourselves the question, but generally they are not the right questions. Could you go back to that uh, picture with the uh, straight line that's, that's going to 10 to the power? Um, yeah, this, this one. one. So why is it that other teams uh, are not able to achieve this? Like, so just so the audience understand um, uh, that you, you've, you've been able to achieve this world record, what do you think was the, the key to, to, to breaking this record? Yeah, I think two things are the key. One is to put all the calculations on the GPU so the, the CPU is free, right? So you can use the CPU to slice the data and to understand, to, to, to study the data in such a way that you can understand which other GPU needs what part of the data. So you have, a tremendous, you have 100 billion stars. And you have to divide these 100 billion stars over your 20,000 nodes. And which star do you have to send where? This star has to go there and that star has to go there. It's not good to send the star to the other side of the computer. You want to keep the stars all locally. So you want to send them to nodes nearby and nodes nearby sent to nearby. So all this sort of organization of the data is done by 16 CPUs per GPU. And those CPUs are all busy doing their data splicing and splicing and sending and receiving and listening to each other. What do you want? Do you want that one star? Yeah, you get that one star. No, you, you, you'll get it. You know, you get it later. You know? So that, that sort of things. Okay. That's done by the CPUs. Okay. Just to, to, to make the professor feel at home, like at the conference, I'd like to ask for a standing ovation so we can repeat the computer conference, <laughs> but on this. So please give a big applause. Please stand up and we'll repeat it. So thank you very much um, for your talk. We have a little gift. Uh, which is uh, we would like to give it to you. And if you have more questions, a professor will be standing over here. You can ask more questions uh, on the topic. And thank you very much for your time and your explanation on this work. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks.